guys welcome back to my channel and today I wanted to talk to you about some really cool stuff that happened in 2012 when Aaron and I went back to film in Jerome Arizona so Aaron and I had decided that we wanted to go back and film like an entire documentary uh, for YouTube at Jerome in the Jerome Grand Hotel and so we needed to hire some help so we had originally hired a camera tech and a guy named John Kelly we'd actually done some sort of a contest I can't remember what it was on Facebook with all of our fans and basically had everybody submit some sort of a blurb on their experience in ghost hunting, what they've done before, if they would be afraid to stand alone in the dark, and if they would be able to handle going to one of America's most haunted locations. So out of all of the people that applied, we went with a guy named John Kelly. John Kelly had been following us for a while since we had been um, you know, on Paranormal Challenge with the Travel Channel. And so John was super excited when we picked him and he ended up being a friend. So a couple days ago, I got a hold of John and I said, you know, I'd really love it if we could sit down on Skype and chat about what happened when we went back in 2012. I have been wanting to share this story for a long time, but I haven't because what actually happened sounds like it's out of a movie. It sounds like, you know, it was something from Hollywood. And the whole time that this, you know, was going on, I was afraid to share it because I didn't want anyone to think that I was making it up. I thought he would be a really good person to have this conversation with since he was an eyewitness to the entire thing. So this was the third incident that I had had while in Jerome. If you've watched any of my other videos, I do talk about my experiences on the set with Paranormal Challenge and Zach Bagans. I've told you guys before that the few times that I've witnessed what I believe to be possession, I think there's only two types of people that can experience possession. One is someone that is very weak-minded or um, not grounded as far as saying that's not something they want to experience. And the second type of person that I believe can be possessed or I've witnessed being possessed is someone that actually wants to feel possession or they want to know what it's like to be possessed. Now at the time that we went back to Jerome in 2012, which is the conversation you guys are about to see between John Kelly and myself, I was not as experienced or fluent in possession or in a certain situation where someone could be in harm's way or something like this could happen. I know that I had already been through a couple of dark incidences. This one was definitely the top. This is probably one of the worst experiences that I've ever been through. I actually just finished interviewing John and I'm about to show you guys the footage. So anyway guys, I'm going to show you this footage of John and I having a chat about Jerome, Arizona. I will see you guys in a few minutes. What is up John? I'm so excited that you were able to chat with me because I have been dying to tell everybody what we went through yeah it was it was some crazy stuff for sure how have you been i've been good i've been really good so now i just want to like bring everybody up to date we aaron and i from paranormal challenge did some sort of a like i think it was like a competition everybody that wanted to go with us to film uh we were going to basically pick somebody you'd been following us for a while and aaron and i picked you and we were like let's do this and so we scheduled a trip to Jerome for like five days and this was god was this like 2012 I think or something like that yeah, or okay was it yeah and uh so you were going as production help like you were like the official production assistant like you pretty much filled in wherever we needed you is what what you did Yep, sure did. <laughs> okay, so we left on, God, a Sunday night, and I think we got there 
in wee hours of like the morning of, of Monday, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Makes it sounds about right. And Chris was, uh, he's still the manager of Jerome Grand Hotel and Chris had told me, um, I'll basically give you access to the entire hotel and the old building. And we were like, yes, we are going to do this like giant ghost hunt documentary. And uh, we were ready for it. So I, I think we planned Wednesday was the day that we were going to actually start officially filming and, and investigating. And I just wanted everybody to kind of chill for a couple of days because it was such a, it was like a 14 hour drive, wasn't it? Or something like that. 12, 13, something like that, yeah. Yeah, all the way, we went Denver to New Mexico to Arizona. Is that the way you guys still drive it? Yes. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, yeah, with a couple stops in between in case you need to go potty, right? Oh, right. yes. Oh, man, it's a long drive. I'm glad that I'm only a few hours <laughs> from Jerome now. Um, so... This is like, this is kind of is an intense topic because this was like some serious shit, you know, that we went through here. And I've wanted to share this for a while, but I think I told you, I was really afraid that people weren't going to believe what I went through because, I mean, what all of us went through really, you know, but it, it almost sounds like a new episode of The Exorcist. <laughs> right? I mean, an authentic version, if you will. So, I mean, I know, so we got there Monday. Uh, Monday, we basically hung out around the whole town of Jerome. And then, um, you know, Monday night, we went to dinner, didn't we? We really hung out and did all this random stuff. And um, Tuesday, I had uh, scheduled an interview walkthrough with Chris. Um, in the old building, which is the original hospital from like the 1700s, and no one lives in that. There is a couple of businesses. Lonnie has a business out of there. Uh, there's a lady named Melissa that has a rock shop. Um, but Chris was going to give us like an actual tour interview of the rest of the building, and it was the first time you'd been in there too. Yes. And so just so everybody else knows, it was Aaron from Paranormal Challenge, me, Chris the manager, you were there, and then we had a camera tech that was there that he had been hired to, you know, basically just do the camera work. He wasn't doing any sort of investigating. He wasn't trained in it. He didn't believe in the paranormal. He didn't, he wasn't interested in it really. He was in film school and we were helping basically build his resume. And you were more interested in the paranormal than he was. And you were helping do everything. Like you were doing camera work set up ghost hunting, invest, right? Like you were doing everything with us. Yeah, anything so, you needed, that's what I was doing. Yeah, a little bit of everything. John, I need you. No. <laughs> so um, this other guy, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about his name or who he was. And that's only because he did, um, didn't want to be associated. Like, let's just be honest. Like he, he had such a, a traumatic experience. So out of respect for him, I don't really want to use his name. But so that night, or that day, I guess, rather, that we were inside um, the old hospital. So Chris and I, you know, we did this interview walkthrough type of thing. You were helping with like video and audio, and Aaron and I were doing the interviews. And then um, when we were done, we had some time, and so we all decided to split up from the three levels. So the basement level, the mid level, and the top level. And the reason we wanted to do that was because Ghost Adventures did that and they had gotten a lot of really good evidence. And I think if I remember correctly, it just had gotten nightfall. I mean, we're not talking nighttime, but it just got a little dark outside, right? Yeah, it was, it was sun was setting a little bit. It was starting to get dark. Okay, and I, that's when I was like, let's just try this. And you were like, yes, no. <laughs> so uh, you and Aaron went to the third floor, right? Yes. And then, oh, there's a car outside, sorry live it's a live video what do you expect no <laughs> um middle level was you me and chris. and chris yeah me and chris which is the manager and then the the basement floor or the bottom floor was the camera tech right okay so we're like all investigating separately we have walkie talkies so that we can communicate 
and and camera you know each of us have cameras don't we and we have like ghost gear and everything we're just investigating and time got away from us and we realized that it was it's been like 30 45 minutes probably more closer to the 45 minute side yeah that sounds right and i think i you had the walkie and i walkied to you and i said john is the camera tech up there and you were like no no one's come up right right yeah. and it was with you guys. So yeah. I had no idea where he was. So then we all got concerned because we were like, well, he was by himself. So Chris and I kind of panicked because we're like, where's everybody at? Because he's not responding through the walkie. Exactly. And so Chris and I go downstairs to the first floor of the old building, and we can't find him. And so we assume he, maybe he got scared and, and left the building. I don't, you know, we don't know. And we hear this really faint knocking, really faint knocking. And we can't figure out where it's coming from because there's several doors to the outside on that main floor. So, and it's big, like it's a pretty big area, right? And it's dark in there. I mean, we only had our flashlights. There's no it's, electricity. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, no lights in that sucker whatsoever. So Chris and I are walking and we realize that the, the knocking noise is definitely coming from the morgue, the morgue room. But the question is, who the hell is in the morgue by themselves, right? Like, yeah. for that long. And the, you're, there's a back door, you know, that, that entrance way in the back. But it wasn't yes. coming from there. And so we realized that someone has locked themselves, or what we assume to have locked themselves, inside of the body freezer. And you guys, ha you and Aaron, haven't been down to the first floor. No, other than walking in, that was it. Right. You know, he said, here's the morgue, this is that. And then it was straight upstairs, you know, through the rest of the whole tour and the interview. And that was, that was it. And I hadn't gone back down with Chris, because Chris and I were still investigating. Right. And so we're like, we hear this guy, and it's the camera tech. The camera tech... So we, of course, you know, Chris and I are trying to open the door, and we can't get the door open. Um, apparently, he's been yelling and cursing, and like, I mean, I would be too. He thinks, he's basically accused all of us of locking him inside the body freezer. Right. And we didn't, and none of us were down there. And why would we anyways? It was an interview. It wasn't, it's not like we had an investigation set up, you know? And so he claims that he walked into the body freezer and that somebody, that he thought one of us were behind him and basically locked him in there. And all of us are like, no, we did. why would we do that? I wouldn't, if someone locked me in a morgue in a body freezer, I would come unglued, like, you know. And, and you know how I run things. I would never do that to somebody, you know. Not at all. Like, that's terrifying. Like... <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we got him out, and apparently it had been like 45 minutes that he'd been locked in this body freezer. So he must have been in there like right away, like went in there right away. And he says he doesn't remember walking in there, and none of us are... I think that there was a point that all of us started to think he was full of shit. Because yeah. I think we all thought, like, you did this on purpose, like you're trying to get attention... And we're like, you know, even Chris is like, there's really no lock on there. It shouldn't have not come open easily. So anyway, with that being said, just to fast forward, when I did go back to Jerome in March, <laughs> I talked to Chris again about that incident. And Chris told me that he did take workers, like, you know, construction workers and crew down there because he goes, I didn't want anyone to accidentally get locked in the body freezer because we'll be liable for it since we own the building. And so they were basically going to crack the lock on the door to the freezer. And when they got in there, there is no lock whatsoever. So they couldn't even break the lock or... So, and you know, they he said we tested it. We had people go in there, you know, to like... And he goes, it was open right by itself right away. Wow. So that was weird, you know, now, and that's now, it's 2016, I didn't even find that out till a couple months ago. So this is when the camera tech starts to get sick, right? 
Yeah, I think so. So what do you remember about that part? Well, I remember, again, like you were saying, he was he was upset. He was angry because he thought we had did, uh, you know, shut him in there, and we didn't. Um, I remember going back up to the hotel room and kind of doing little investigations in there, and, and he seemed okay. Like, it passed. He was he was still a little not himself, but uh, it the feeling of the... I don't know how to say it uh the whole moment had passed basically and uh he seemed okay while we were investigating some of the other rooms but i remember it was the next night that it actually gone crazy and that's when shit hit the fan basically yeah so yeah. then we had another walkthrough right and yes. the other uh, we met with uh, melissa we yeah melissa the rock shop um earlier that day she was just moving in to that space and uh we found out that she was from colorado so we sat there and talked to her to see if she had experienced anything and i know she had experienced a few things in there you know bumps and knocks and other stuff like that and didn't she say that it, she thought the ghosts were stealing her toilet paper or something weird like yes. that yeah that's what it was yeah I remember that. yeah that was a little weird and awkward i don't i don't know <laughs> that was <laughs> awkward <laughs> Well, let me tell you what could be happening. No, I'm joking. <laughs> oh. But, um, no, we set up an interview for uh, later after she closed the shop. And um, while you guys were doing the interview, there were more knocks and noises in the, in the building behind her. And so she took us up and through. And uh, Now, this is the same building we had been in before. This yeah, is the same yeah, old hospital. Old yeah. And uh, that's when the camera tech started feeling really weird and acting kind of anxious to get out of there. And um, I don't even think we were in there for 20 minutes. We went all the way up to the third floor, and uh, that was pretty much it. You know, he's like, well, we got to get out of here. I, I don't feel good. I don't, you know. He started out. to sweat. I mean, it was like, yeah. I mean, visibly. It wasn't just him saying that. Exactly, exactly. Like, you could see the sweat just pouring down off of his face. And he wasn't facing the light, obviously, because he had cameras. So it was just weird. None of us were really that hot or sweaty. So we're just like, okay, whatever. And he literally booked it out of that shop. And then I remember um, following him over to the railing on the side of the road and watching him cough up blood, which was strange to me. You know, he hadn't been coughing. There was nothing, you know, to signify that he would be sick so to see him coughing up blood was a little strange and kind of freaked me out honestly but it was just it was weird and that's when i got you and aaron and we decided to just go back up to the hotel yeah that was weird i remember saying where is it because i was like i i felt like you i wanted proof and i remember there was just spots and speckles of blood all over the sidewalk even where he had missed and i was like what the heck is this a joke you know I was like and you're like no I've been watching him do this for like 10 minutes yes yeah because at first I thought you know he had some fake blood and he was just covering his mouth and and doing it that way but there was no no it was it was all real <laughs> I know it was pretty scary it was weird it was one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had yes. so I remember that he went, we wanted to like shake it off basically. So we took all the equipment back to the hotel and then we decided to go eat in downtown Jerome. Yes. And uh, it was getting late at that point and we went to the Haunted Hamburger, which is like the coolest freaking restaurant ever. Speaking of that, did you get to see it when you were there last time? How much it changed? It looks great, doesn't it? They have a balcony in the back now. Yeah. So it looks awesome. It looks great. So I remember towards the end of the meal, we, I said, oh crap, you guys. And Aaron and, and, and I both said, we know what these storms are like here in Jerome. It's no joke because it sits on the si very high side of the mountain. And when they get lightning storms, it's not like three miles away. It's like right in front of your face. And I told you guys, it wasn't even raining. It was just thunder and lightning. And yeah, exactly. I remember telling you guys, like, I'm not going to wait. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
So I think Aaron and I t didn't, seriously, Aaron and I took off running, didn't we? I mean, literally. And so we, Aaron and I ran, <laughs> I'm sorry I left you by the way. <laughs> okay, you know, I was kind of the parent in me was trying to make sure that he was okay too, even though he's like the same age, kind of close. Yeah. But you know, just that fatherly figure, I wanted to make sure that he was still okay. You know, yeah. He seemed all right. So, was, so I um, ran. <laughs> So I'm terrible. That's, that tells you in a survival situation, I would be like, sorry guys, I'm not out, no. And <laughs> this is exactly why I don't do cryptozoology because if something scary happened, I would be the first one out of there. Like I would not investigate, like it would freak me out. <laughs> So, so for everybody watching that asks me why I don't do crypto, John is proof that if I ran into the Bigfoot, I would be out of there. Like I would not be investigating it. Before you can even get her name out, she's gone. Oh my God. There's no little hill to run up. Oh, that no. Is Isn't that true? So literally, Aaron and I took off on foot from practically the haunted hamburger all the way up to the top of the mountain. And I mean, we got there fast. Like, I don't even remember it happening because I was like, I, <laughs> but you know, I do remember Aaron and I were both screaming our heads off because the lightning so bad. I mean, it, it will strike in front of you. Like, no kidding, like inches. And yeah. so in the meantime, I left you and the camera tech behind. <laughs> I left you guys behind. I, like some big tough ghost hunter here. Like I can handle being in a morgue and being with the dead, but when it comes to a lightning storm, I'm out of there, you know? That's how I am with all natural disasters, by the way. Like I'm just not someone that you would want in a tornado or anything. <laughs> so, um, so you guys are behind us. So I was not here, yeah, so I wasn't, uh, yeah, way behind us, obviously. So the camera tech, we think, had really gotten, like, physically and emotionally affected by coughing up blood, and he got locked in the icebox and all this stuff. And so he says he can't run. And I, I don't think that's the case, but he says that he can't run. I think that he's just kind of panicked. So you're walking with him, and I wasn't here for this. I was with Aaron, gone. So I'm going to let you talk about what happened while you guys were walking up the hill. Okay. Well, I guess a little backstory. Um, you had told me about these things called crawlers that are around the whole area. Um, a I lot of people see claim them. they see them. I've seen them in the building. And if right. you don't know what a crawler is, they're like... They, they claim, I don't know, I've never been close enough to see if they have a face. It's claimed they don't have faces, but it's some sort of maybe ectoplasm or something that it looks like a person crawling on hands and, and knees, right? Like up walls and everything. Yeah, like huge hands. Yeah. Okay. So, figure, yeah. We were walking and um, he decided, he's like, do you see that in front of us? I see what there's a couple cars in front of us. I don't I don't see anything. He's like, no, there's there's something up there. I can't make out what it is just yet, but there's something up there. And I'm like, okay, thinking maybe it's a cat. Maybe who knows? I mean, it's it's Arizona. I've never been. I don't know what's around there. Could be a baby coyote for all I know. Um, and then we start walking, and the lightning flashes, and he starts freaking out. He's like, oh crap! You know, it's coming right towards us. You need to run. And I'm like. You can't run. I'm not running. You know, I'll be right here with you. He's like, well, either way, this thing's coming. And he got ready for impact. And then the thunder boomed and the thing went down the mountain. And that's when I saw like a shoulder, a leg, something huge and kind of brown in a way. It was really weird. Uh, go down the mountain. And then I see the grass moving. And so me being curious. So me being curious and a little scared at the same time, I, I go to look because I want to know what it is. And and like I said, I don't see any animal down there. And it's, it's really steep hill. You can't really get a deer or anything to come up and down the mountain without falling and breaking its neck. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's houses and stuff right there and people's yards. And there was nothing there. You guys are yelling at us the whole time. Hey, hurry up, hurry up. Yeah. We're just like, wait till we tell you what we just saw. Yeah. You know? And so that was my first encounter with the crawler. It was really scary, and he was freaking out too because it charged us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I've seen him in that building. They haven't charged me, but I, I've seen him on the ceilings and stuff. And I, They've never come up to me, and I don't know if it's because 
I don't know why. Honestly, I feel like really dark stuff has always been kind of afraid of me, so maybe that's why it, it I repel it. I don't know. Um, so we go into the building, and you guys are like chatty Kathy about like what just happened, and Aaron and I are like, I don't give a shit. We just survived a lightning storm. <laughs> you know? yes, yes. So we go up to our rooms, and we were um, scheduled that night to give a tour to fans from Paranormal Challenge and fans from Ghost Adventures to tour um, the building of Jerome. And there was like probably, what, 15 or 20 people there that had prepaid in advance to do this. And um, so we all had walkies and stuff, and we get up to the room, which we were setting up for a ghost hunt in the dead room, or in the emergency rooms, which are also the dead rooms. And that's, what is that, 25 and 27? Uh, 23, 25. 23, 25. And it's conjoining rooms with one bathroom. It was yeah. the original, yeah, um, and that's where most of the people died in these rooms. Yeah, that was like the hospice rooms or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it was like yeah. right before they were about to die, they basically took them to this area. Yes, and, yes. And, um... We've always had a lot of activity, which is why we were actually sleeping in those rooms as a team, but we were going to investigate as well. So then when we get in the rooms, the camera tech is still freaking out about, like, for some reason, this has affected him as, like, icing on the cake. And we're getting ready to go tour and ghost hunt with fans, and all of a sudden, the camera tech starts losing his shit saying that what did he tell you was in the bathroom there was a purple demon under the sink it was a little purple demon under the sink and it was staring at him taunting him and wanted to come inside of him yeah he he, ca out, he, he told all us that he told all of us yeah. that yes. and so now we're asking if he's taken some drugs behind our back <laughs> yes. no yes. seriously like it's we're laughing now at the time we were not laughing <laughs> No, it was freaky as hell. Yeah, yeah, at the time we were like, did he take drugs? Like, ser right? Seriously, we don't know him that well. I mean, because you had even had previous experience ghost hunting, even before yeah. that. Yes. And so, he says there's a purple demon, and he's repeating it, that's yes. in the bathroom, and it wants to attack him, it wants to enter his body, it wants to take him over. Like, he's saying everything that you wouldn't want to hear. And for some reason, he's using the term demon. And yes. now this, at this point is when I step in because I'm like, I can't let you guys deal with this because it's just not fair. You know, I, I was most experienced and I was like, this is not, I need to deal with this. So now the tour is about to start and I am like more concerned about the well-being and health of this person and I say, John, I need you to go with Aaron and help give this tour. Yep. And so you and Aaron leave and you go start touring this like 20, 20 people, 25 people throughout the, the hotel and you have walkies. And I'm in with the camera tech and he starts to lose it. And he is... Now, take in mind, when he was originally hired, once again, he didn't believe in anything. He called it specifically bullshit, um, which I didn't care about. He, I was more concerned about him just being a camera tech, not an investigator, so I didn't care what his beliefs were. As long, I, And my question in the interview when I hired him was, as long as you can handle being in the dark with a potentially haunted location, and he agreed to it because he said he didn't believe in it. So... Now, I'm in the room with the camera tech, and he's goes from being this really tough guy that's not afraid of anything to now he's saying there's something in the bathroom trying to kill him, trying to take him over. It wants to kill him. And now he's laying on the bed in a fetal position, crying his eyes out, terrified that it's going to get him. And... He can't sit still. He's thrashing around. And this is going on for, I'd say, 15 or 20 minutes before I walkie you and Aaron, right? Yep. So what did I say to you guys? Um, well, 
I remember you getting on the walkie, you're like, you know, hey, I need you guys to stop doing what you're doing. Come down here. Camera tech's freaking out. He's thrashing around. He wants to throw all of his equipment out the window. He's freaking out about the demon still. One of you guys or both of you guys come down. Since I didn't really know much about the hotel other than what I've seen on Paranormal Challenge and Ghost Adventures, uh, he decided, you know, Aaron, you go ahead and continue doing the, the whole, you know, showing around the hotel and I'll go down and I'll see what's up and see if I can help. That way there's another guy down there, you know, whatever. And so I get down and I knock on the door. He opens the door. Whoops, wait, one sec. There you go. Okay, it cut you off. Okay, go ahead again. And so I get down and I knock on the door. He opens the door. And so I get down and I knock on the door. He opens the door. And so I get down and I knock on the door. He opens the door. So I, I walk down the stairs. I, I go into our rooms. And I uh, knock, and you open the door like the quickest I've ever seen anybody open a door. And you're like, I don't know what to do. He's freaking out still. He wants to throw his stuff. And so I come in, and, and I see this big, tough, strong guy crying. That's like the first thing I see after talking to you. He's crying. He's in the fetal position. He's pointing to the bathroom still. I don't want it to come inside me. Tell it to go away. It's freaking me out. It, it wants to kill me. And, and I'm like... Oh crap, what did I just walk into? You know? <laughs> it's like not exactly something you would expect for somebody to have to deal with for their first like real investigation, I guess you would say, because I was still pretty new at the time. Right. I had done a few things by myself that were nowhere near <laughs> this caliber. So I I was like what do you want to do? I'm Can like, I say me daughter. too? I was I mean I had filmed and stuff, but I mean, to be perfectly honest, I was not fluent in dealing with something like this. And I mean, I, I feel like I, I would be able to handle that situation better now that I have, you know, what, four or five more years under my belt. Yeah. But anybody out there that's watching this, you can say that this is what I would have done or whatever your religious background is, fine. But when it actually happens, you kind of have like an out-of-body experience, don't you? Because you're like... Oh, this is an actual, this isn't a movie. I'm not watching this movie, right? Like, this is in real life, and holy hell. Like, right. and you almost forget how to deal with it. You know what I mean? Like, because you're in shock yourself. Right. And so I, I didn't know what to do. So he, he was, he was, he actually had thrown, uh, I think that my, I had my MacBook there. And yes. he had thrown my expensive MacBook laptop. And that's like a $4,000 laptop. He had thrown it across the room. And that's when he started to threaten. We had all of expensive camera gear, ghost gear. He had actually opened the window. And at the time, they've changed it now, but they didn't have uh, screens on the windows. Do you remember? And, remember? and he was threatening to throw all of the gear out the window and we're on the technically the third story and I'm like there goes hundreds of dollars thousands of dollars down the toilet right I mean so I needed somebody to come in and basically try to help me kind of apprehend him and so I remember when you got in didn't you start first taking all the equipment I told you to put it in like the the hallway that one hallway put it a hallway and then uh, Aaron and I Yes. Because there was sleeper in there. So, so he wouldn't move from the bed or, you know, the room. Mostly, he, he'd get off the bed, grab something, try to throw it out the window, and then get back on the bed. Yeah. And freak more. But, so I put it in the hallway and then in the, in the, uh... Yeah, because we had several GoPros, too. I mean, those are not cheap when you add that much stuff up. And so now, in the meantime, I'm like... Okay, we brought holy water and stuff like that. We knew the St. Michael prayer. We knew how to get, you know, I guess basic help down from above if you look at it from a religious stance. And so, I mean, because it got out of hand. He was like banging on the headboard, kicking the headboard. He was doing like full 360 degree like flips wasn't he like like it was just ridiculous it was stuff you would see in a movie yeah and 
is just yeah. <laughs> and he had never, and he was very, he was kind of, I hate to say this, but he was kind of like the asshole type of personality. He was the yeah. type that was more concerned with um, his projection appearance from the outside. He doesn't want people to judge him, so he's gonna stay centered. And so I don't think this was a show by any means. Um, especially because of him puking up blood for 15 minutes. Right. And so he starts doing the spinning thing, and he's pouring sweat still, just pouring sweat. I mean, like, a, a flood. And he, he's crying, and it's just, his shirt's soaked, I remember that. And he's shaking. I mean, he was like, it was like convulsions, almost. Honestly, looking back, I probably should have called 911. There was a point, seriously. But I think that once again, when you're in that position and it's actually happening, right. you're in shock. And so right. I, I remember you got all the equipment moved out. And basically, like just to put it bluntly, you and I started grabbing holy water and started spraying him with holy water. Um, he started welting from the holy water on his arms and his face. Yes. And that was when he was like, I don't care if it's holy water, but he was telling us that it was burning and it was welting. I um, that. Take in mind, we didn't document any of this. Why? Because we think that this person's dying in front of us, basically, right? And yeah. so you and I are now, we've like sprayed him down, we've sprayed the room down, we've sprayed the bed down the bathroom <laughs> right like you and i went from like ceiling to floor just everything right and so and we're like you and i are saying the saint michael prayer and we're, i mean we god how long do you think that we did this for like an hour at least at least aaron was still gone and still doing the the tour and everything else he knew <laughs> yeah, Aaron wasn't there. He had no thank God. I mean that he was able to be there for the the fans and stuff. So you and I are playing preacher basically, right? I mean, we were saying prayer. You knew different prayers, I knew different pr like we just did what we had to do. Exactly. We didn't know what was going to work, so we just threw everything out there and see. Yep, just hoping. And yeah. finally, we did notice it started to work. But that's why I think we kept doing it was because it was like it would improve the longer we kept going. Yep. And finally, when he stopped crying, he literally stopped. It was like normal people will like sniffle and, you know, like we've all cried, I'm sure, at some point in our life. And normal people will sniffle and slow, slow down. But it was like he stopped. Yeah, it was like a switch, and then it was over. And uh, I remember when he came out of it, whenever that officially was, he he sat up and he goes, I want to get the f out of here. Yep. And he was like, I know that we're supposed to leave here till you know on Friday, which was like three days later. We'd only been there for two days. But he goes, if you don't... Basically, you know, let us leave as a team. I'm going to hitchhike back to Denver. All the way from Jerome, Arizona. Yeah. And so, you know, I had plans, obviously. We had access to the entire hotel. And obviously, it, it didn't cost five pennies for us to take that trip down there. But, you know, for the safety of the team, I had to make the decision that this person was not healthy and we left and when we got back to Denver literally um, for about two weeks I don't even know if you know this I had to go over to his house basically every day he was having like smoke appear I mean and I'm not talking the apparition kind I mean like like actual something was on fire and we could never find a source for it um, and so I would go over there and I would do the St. Michael prayer and the protection prayers and I would do the smudging and, and holy water stuff and it took two weeks to get it out of his house if, if it did officially. And then finally when he thought it was gone, he told me that, he goes, I'm, I'm quitting. I, wow. I don't want to do this. I'm done. 
it scared me way too bad and this is not worth my camera tech career and, and cinematography. So, um, that was pretty intense though. I mean, so now you've been back to Jerome a couple times since that happened. Yes. Do you think that, I mean, you've actually probably become a very serious investigator since that happened because it was your first time really experiencing, well, I mean, that was one of my first times <laughs> experiencing that, hopefully my last, but do you think that maybe you kind of got a bond with Jerome from that experience since you've been back so many times? I think so, and, and it's funny because I definitely want to go back again. I'm already thinking about and trying to plan going back. Um, I did talk to Chris a couple times, and you know, when I went back the first time after we had gone, uh, it was it was kind of crazy because uh, Chris had remembered me from when we went and the whole situation with the camera tech, and it was it was I know it's a small town, but it's just kind of weird to have everybody know what happened when it was so just condensed into us. It it felt like I mean I know you obviously had to let Chris know what was going on. Mm -hmm. But for for the rock shop, all of them to know Lonnie even, and you know, and they were all asking, "Hey, how is he doing?" And at that point, I hadn't really talked to him, so I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it was just it was crazy and surreal. It's just yeah. Yeah, I we had the the following day we ended up leaving early, like eight in the morning or something. Yes. And we had we were supposed to have an interview with Lonnie that morning, and then that night was like the lockdown like we were legitimately gonna investigate that night everything and uh, I had to call Lonnie and apologize all over myself because I don't like to set up interviews and then we're not there to do it that make doesn't make me look bad you know good um, and then I had to tell Chris and you know Chris was expecting us you know he booked that week for us to not he had no customers, which I'm sure was a lot of money that he lost. And, um, you know, he booked it as an empty for us. Literally, he had, if you, I mean, tell everybody how cool it was to have the entire Jerome Hotel. Chris went through and opened every single door for us, didn't he? Yes, he did. It was, it was great, you know, walking up any floor, pick a floor, pick a room. We can go in, we can investigate. It was yeah, great. I know. Fourth floor, I remember we walked up there and all the doors were open and it was like... It was like our version of Candyland, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, I did. I had to apologize to Chris, but it was like, what do we do? I mean, I mean, going back now, I don't know if I should have really wasted the the money and you know by not leaving. Maybe I could have at least put him in a hotel by himself in like Cottonwood, you know, until we were done. I really regret missing that opportunity um, but luckily I've been able to mend my you know friendship with Chris um, since he understood now that it's it wasn't a personal issue it was that someone really we thought was in potential life-threatening danger you know and uh, so that's hopefully Chris you know I've talked to him about maybe being able to have fans come out again and actually do like ghost hunts um, and you know like tours and all that stuff again like that we could do that like one-on-one -on -one. so hopefully you'll be able to join us if we do that definitely that'd be great it was intense man and thank you for surviving through it with me and and Aaron and uh I mean I don't know you know like Aaron had we thought a possession on set with paranormal challenge I know that we I told you that and I, I've shared that on YouTube as well but this was just even worse than that. I mean, with the blood and the the seeing things and getting locked in the body, you know, the the freezer body freezer thing, you know, all this stuff. And I've never been through that again. And I think that's why I really started to learn more about, you know, versing myself in darker stuff. And that's only to protect the team, because like I treat my team like a family, and I don't want anyone to ever get hurt. That was yeah. not fun. That was scary. No, it was definitely scary. I mean, we laugh a little bit about it now just because of how, I guess, inexperienced we were at something like that and how it just threw us all for a loop. And yeah. 
uh, definitely not a laughing matter, but I'm glad everything worked out okay and everybody's healthy now. And, and he quit uh, paranormal investigating. <laughs> yes, yeah, he's done with that. He so do you, in your opinion, since not a lot of people witness stuff like this for obvious reasons, um, it's and it's probably... People always say, well, why didn't you capture it on film? It's like, dude, you weren't in the moment. You don't realize how intense that is when it's happening. You don't have time to grab a camera. The window was open with no screen. I was more worried he was going to throw one of us outside the window. Exactly. Jump out himself for that matter. Exactly. And, so, and, and he wouldn't let us go near the window. I mean, it was really weird. So, I mean, in your opinion even though neither of us are, is anyone versed in possession. But do you think that's what occurred? I do. Honestly, I do. It just, I've never seen anything else like it. And, and doing a little bit more research and studying, that's what I come up with. I don't have any other explanation as to what it could have been. Uh, he obviously had no drugs. So, we searched. I, I remember you searched. I, I know that sounds terrible, and anyone watching this, I don't want anyone to think that I hire people and search their stuff. But I do. I remember after you moved all of the equipment, I told you to go through his stuff and look for drugs. It yeah, it wasn't for invasion of privacy. It was just making sure that he wasn't tripping on something. Right. It was more for his health than for our health, for that matter. Yeah, it was. And I, I usually test everybody for drugs before on set because I don't want anyone to be under the influence of anything. I think I think you signed a contract with us, and I always have that in the clause where I don't care if you get what you do in your personal time, but you know, 48 hours, 72 hours before set, don't be under the influence because I don't want you to be susceptible to that. And uh, he had passed the drug test. So I knew it wasn't anything prior, but I did. We went through his stuff to make sure because in the real world, that's what you do to make sure that, you know, he wasn't having some sort of a really bad trip on something. I mean, we just didn't know because it was like, how could this go from pretty normal to so extreme so fast? Right, and it was pretty quick too. I mean, yeah. Man. I know. Well, thank John. You're awesome. Thank you so much for talking with me and chatting about this and like crazy, crazy lifestyles of ghost hunting and paranormal. And it's, it's just a lesson to everybody out there too, to make sure that they are really careful dealing with this stuff. Even if you're a non-believer, it's okay to be a non-believer. And for the record, if anyone's wondering why I think this happened, I think that when this camera tech got locked he claims that something basically pushed him into this body chamber fridge and locked him in and I truly believe he may have thought it was one of us since he was a non-believer and I think that when he got locked inside of the chamber he started to provoke really bad because that was just the type of person he was he admitted to provoking and I think that when he started the provoking and disrespecting whatever it was that was there it got mad, whatever it is, and basically made his life hell for the next three weeks. So, well, thank you, John, for everything. You're super awesome. I really have to give a big shout out to John because if John wouldn't have been there, I don't know if I would have been able to handle the situation the way we did. Um, and John, thank you very much for helping me make sure that all of us survived and that you know you really had my back and I really had your back at that time. And I'm just really glad that we got through it and made it through alive. Don't like talking about super dark stuff because I've told you guys that it's not something that I'm interested in. I really feel like I'm more of the light side. I'm more of the communicator that it's more exciting to you know, catch EVPs and find things on video and, and interact with the other side. I want to bring to light to everyone that, you know, you can have these abilities of being an empath. You can catch real, raw, authentic footage and evidence on tape, on camera. And interacting with the dead isn't as scary as Hollywood has portrayed it to be. However, with that being said, certain situations, none of us really know how we're going to act or deal with unless we're actually in the situation. Even now that I have four years under my belt on top of that, um, everyone out there can judge and say, I should have done this, I should have done that. 
looking back, I can even kind of pick on myself and say certain things should have been handled differently. But it's really different when you're in the situation and you're stressed and scared and in shock. And, um, you know, I think there's still part of you, like, I really think that maybe I should have called 911 uh, for the camera tech that was being affected now looking back at it. But it's also a really hard conversation when you're going through that mode of what should I do? How are you gonna get on the phone with the police dispatch at 911 and tell them we're in a haunted hotel and this person's throwing up blood and you know, all this stuff and we think that it's due to a demon possession? You have to really be careful and think about that. Like You also don't want people to judge you or laugh at you and maybe even in that case, someone, you know, the police may not have sent anyone to help him, maybe they would have thought it was a prank call. So you have to really realize that there's a lot of elements and a lot of different layers that are involved when you're investigating, when there could be something potential like a possession happen. I did start to verse myself more on uh, religion and um, the dark side, I guess, just to make sure that if any future incidences occurred that I would feel confident enough to be able to handle it. And because of this experience that John and I had and the team had, would just warn people to not provoke and, and do things dangerously because I understand there's skeptics, I understand there's people that don't believe, that's okay. And, and you know, even if you feel like um, there's some sort of a dark energy that's been harming things and or people and animals and you go in to provoke because you're trying to stand up to the bully, I really understand that and I'm not here to tell anyone how they should or shouldn't investigate. But I am here to tell you guys that understand whatever you do when you're investigating, even provoking, understand that there will be consequences or there could be consequences. Whether you're a skeptic, a believer, an investigator, a priest, it doesn't matter. If you're interacting with this side, even if you don't believe in it, and you provoke, just make sure that you're prepared to handle whatever the consequences are. For the record, John, myself, and Aaron, none of us were affected by whatever was affecting this camera tech that we had hired. It solely affected him. And we truly believe that that was in correlation to him provoking. Do I have any advice for people that think they experience a possession or see a possession? Not really. I can only tell you that I have tried to learn myself and, and you know teach myself things to help me in that situation. I don't know if that's necessarily the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. I'm not a demonologist. I've never claimed to be one, but I really think that you need to do your research if you're looking for, for certain advice like that. When you're in a situation that's like this that we went through, especially if it's just sporadic and last minute and you didn't realize that it was going to happen, you just have to do things at the moment that are in your ability to think that you can take care of the situation properly. And you can't beat yourself up over later if you think you should have done things differently. The number one rule I have for my team, and I mean this in paranormal investigators that I hire or just regular film crew that I hire, the number one rule is always safety comes first. And I shouldn't have left because it did cost a lot of money to get there, but at the end of the day, the biggest concern was making sure that we got everything out and everyone out safely. And that was what we did. And I feel like I made the best judgment and call that I could have. I hope that you guys like this video. Please give me a thumbs up. Please make sure you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Leave me good comments below. If anything that you guys want to hear or see next, please make sure that you leave me something below about it. And I will catch you guys next time. We're back from dead and